Yeah, let's start. Okay, so today we're going to have our last uh, lecture together. So it has been a, quite a journey, let's say. And so we are covering today uh, topics that we didn't see a lot during the, um, the, the other lectures, but it's actually one topic that is all about templates. And I tried to, I will try to make um, stuff uh, put the, the stuff easy and simple so you can get this and believe me that if you understand what I'm going to try to teach you in this lecture and if you follow me you will most likely know more than 80% at least of the programmers I know uh, of C++ so templates is a big thing in C++ uh, most of the people are scared about templates and generic program in general my belief is that it's a matter of the syntax so the syntax ugly let's say and the errors are also ugly so i think it tends uh, to be difficult to debug or to develop i don't know so for me it's actually quite simple if you know the basics but i think it's um our fault from the c community that some stuff for us is obvious and sometimes we don't like explicitly say that this is blah 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 and that also makes uh, stuff hard to understand for others so i will try to give you the very basics today we are not going to write a full library on templates of whatever uh, but the idea is that you you should know the bare minimum uh, stuff uh, to work with templates on c++ and don't be scared so first of all uh, most of my slides will be heavily inspired in Arthur's CPP contacts. So I think, I, yes, I already recommended one of uh, his talks uh, about Smart Pointer. So he's really, he presents stuff really easily. So I highly recommend you to watch uh, uh, his CPP contacts. And then the, the idea behind generics programming is that you have, so you separate somehow the data from the algorithms. So in this case, this is not like really like an algorithm, but it's more like a container. So you have a cup of something, and this case is a tea, and this tea, you don't, you don't know what is that, but you can actually put coffee, tea, uh, water, whatever you, you, rice, so you can put whatever you want there. And then the cup itself is not coupled to the type of data that it holds, right? So that's basically the idea of generic programming. So to do some sort of generic algorithms, like sorting a container without having to explicitly know uh, which type of data you're using. So one example of this we already saw uh, when we work with iterators. So iterators is also part of this generic programming idea where all the STL algorithms in the library on the STL library, they work on the iterators and not on the data itself. So if somehow you manage to show how to iterate through your container, then you have access to all the iterators, sorry, all the algorithms in the SDL library. Here are two definitions, like let's quickly discuss this. So what is programming? The graph of writing useful, maintainable, sometimes, and extensible, sometimes, source code, which can be interpreted, and this is Python, or compiled, that this is C, C++, Rust, wherever by a computing system to perform a meaningful task, right? That's the definition. And then what is metaprogramming? So metaprogramming is the writing of computer programs that manipu manipulate other programs or themselves as if they were data. So one of the key concepts behind generic programming is metaprogramming, that is basically write programs that write another programs. And this sounds confusing, but uh, it's actually really easy and we will see how to do this. Um, so what is the meaning of template? So from dictionary, so a template is something that serves as a model for others to copy. It would also be interpreted as a preset format for a document or file, or can be something that is used as a pattern for producing other similar things. So that, those are like three dictionary definitions. And then the C++ definition of template, a short version, is that a template in C++, it's a C++ entity, and we saw entities on lecture one, I guess, that defines one of the following. A family of classes, 
that is called class template, which may, may be or not nested classes. So a template class will define a family of classes. It's not one, two, or three, it's a whole family. So it can be infinite amount of classes. Or you can define a family of functions that is called function template, which may be member functions or not. Like member functions from a given class, right? So that's uh, all the legal definitions. What is the motivation behind generic functions? Is to, again, to split, to um, separate the data from the algorithm uh, and work agnostic to the type of data. So actually we have the absolute value function here. We saw how to do this uh, with function overloading on previous lectures. So you can actually, so let's highlight some stuff here. So you can actually use the same name uh, for a function. This is in C++, you can't do this in C. So here is the absolute value and then it can take different type of data as input argument but if you pay attention to the algorithm or the computation itself it's actually the same right so this is not so the good thing about this is that you can use the apps uh, function uh, without paying attention to so you need to define an apps for each type you can overload its name uh, but it's stupid in in terms of you need to write like how many absolute uh, value functions for your program. So now we have for double and int, but also you should do it for long, and then for int, and then for floating point, and maybe, I know, complex type, maybe car, maybe short, and where does this end? So that's the question, where you should end like writing the same function with the same implementation, but with different type of data. So that's where generic functions will come into place to save you from this pain. And also, to keep Smash in C. Uh, so how they solve this on C, we saw this example when we saw overloading. So they just have like a bunch of functions, like, so this is with even different names. So for long, we have L apps, for long, long, we have L, L absolute, and that's all the C++ 99 standard functions defined. So this is basically a pain because you need to Pay attention to which algorithm to pick depending on the data and also to the data. So, as usual, there is C++ nowadays and there is modern and it can save us from this pain. So we will rewrite the absolute value function but using a template type. This means that this can operate on any sort of data because the implementation is actually the same, no matter if this is an integer, um, Floating point, double, long, character, you name it. And this here is basically, you see like these four lines. Most of the people will say this is a function, but this is not a function, right? Function templates are not functions. They are templates for making functions. That is different, right? And actually you don't pay for what you don't use. So you create a template and we will see one example now. And then if you don't call absolute with integer type, then you don't need to create the, the, the symbol. So you don't pay for what you don't use. In this case, when you do this sort of thing, you always define this function, even if you're not using it, right? So just keep in mind that function templates are not functions. Templates for making functions. This is quite different. And you don't pay for what you don't use. If nobody calls a given function then it won't be instantiated by the compiler. So let's see one example. So my favorite tool, let's say for working with templates is Compiler Explorer. Uh, in this case, we will see like a really, really dumb example. So in this case, we have uh, a template for a function that is called foo, that takes no input arguments and actually that's nothing, right? So it's a dummy function, right? But in the, I just want to show you how, uh, why we say that you don't pay for what you don't use, right? So let's uh, return zero here. And then if we comment this out, and if you see the assembly code, it doesn't matter actually if you don't really understand this right now. 
What I'm showing here is that we only have one symbol on the binary that is called the main, that is actually doing nothing. But if we call a given, uh, if we call this template function with a given type, the compiler at compile time will generate this symbol here. So if you see here, there is a void foo with integer type that does nothing, but it is here, right? And if we call the same template function with another type, then the compiler will generate this other function for us. And again, we are not doing anything particular here, so it's basically zero, but you have the symbol now and you only pay for what you use. Of course, I am using a, uh, turning off the optimization. If you optimize this code, it will just remove everything because you're not doing anything meaningful. So whenever you work with Compiler Explorer, keep in mind like the, the, the optimizer might uh, um, confuse you, right? If we go for the like the the, um, the the normal case, like that's how. So in this case, we actually need to have an integer type, for example. So we have this function foo, and then in this case, what I want to show you is that whenever you do this type of uh, functions declaration, and then double, and then. So I could write the absolute value, but I'm just lazy. In this case, what is happening here is that you're paying for something that you don't use. So, the, so you are actually adding these three symbols, full integer, full of double, and full of floating point to your binary, but you're not using it. So this is your application, you're not using anything, and you're paying for it. So this is something also important about F, the function templates. So you don't pay for what you don't use. So let's go back to the example. And this is uh, the absolute value. And we will see more about the syntax of templates uh, now. So the template functions use the keyword template. And then this, so usually this type here, T is, so this, so you need to use T. So it's common actually, but you can use bananas here. So this is a name, so you pick it. and. In this case, this template function will take as template arguments two types. One is T and the other one is S. And in this case, we'll do something, right? And then remember that a function template defines a family of function, right? It's not a function itself. And then this is one example of using template functions. So as usual, my recommendation is you should check it on your computer. And actually, if you if you um, use Compiler Explorer, you can actually get an insight of what's going on behind the scenes, right? But this is just an example, so let's go through it. So we, we have the absolute uh, template function, and then we have two numbers, one double, one integer, and then we will call the absolute value function with type double, right? And then we pass this double uh, argument, and then we get the result. And this auto is basically a double because T is the same input argument does the as the output. But something that you can also do is to skip the angular brackets and then just pass X. And what is happening here is something magical that is called type deduction. So you have a family of function called absolute, and then the compiler is sees that you are actually trying to generate instantiate one uh, one function from this family of function and then you're trying to use the type double because x is double right so here it's the declaration and then it can infer the type from your call and then you you need you don't need to do this uh, angular bracket syntax so this is something called type detection and we will see more in details something that is extremely important about templates is that templates lives in a static world so this is the lecture number nine, that is the 10th lecture that we have together. And I think that I say the word static on all of the lectures. So it's really important that you understand that whatever is involved with templates will happen at compile time. So there are two uh, conclusions about this. The first one is that a lot of people doesn't know how to use templates. 
or it's confusing or whatsoever. And one of the reasons is you don't reason on a, on a proper way. So whenever you're trying to do something with templates, you should ask yourself the question, do I know this at compile time? No matter what, what you're doing. So always remember this question. Do, do we have this information when we build the program or is it something that will happen at runtime? So for example, if you want to write some sort of algorithm and this algorithm depends on, I know, sensor data coming from a sensor, of course, you cannot do anything with this data at compile time because it's something that will happen at runtime. When your application is running, it will take the input sensor data and will do something. If you don't have this information at compile time, then there's there's no way you can do something with templates. And the second conclusion is that our world, the roboticist world, it's quite dynamic. So usually we work with data coming from sensors and whatsoever. So it's actually very unlikely that you, as a roboticist programmer, need to use templates a lot, except when you're writing libraries or like utilities or whatsoever. But for the core algorithms, that you might use, most of the stuff, 99% will happen at runtime. So with this, I want to give you an advice that don't get really excited with templates. So use it wisely. And I will show you some examples on how to use it. So for example, if you need to write the ICP algorithm, then actually there is nothing you can template. So you cannot write a template for this because all the data, the data association and whatsoever would happen at runtime. So there's nothing you can do at compile time. And this means that you should not be thinking in this whatsoever, right? So keep this in mind. So if we go back to this example, so let's comment this out. And then let's call foo with integer. So this is compiling in this moment, and this function got generated at compile time, right? Everything about templates must happen at compile time. So here, this type integer is already defined at compile time. You cannot put here like a variable, like I don't know, like integer x, and put x here because x. First, it's not a type, it's a variable. Now it's failing, of course. And then even if this, for some reason, is like a variable type, so forget about this, but this is not going to happen. This is something that you cannot guarantee at compile time. So right now here at compile time, you need to say, okay, integer, we know who is this guy. Let's create a function for foo with this type of data. Okay, and then, we saw two definitions of function templates and template classes. So template classes will create a family of classes. So a template class. So class templates are not classes. They are templates for making classes. So it's different. Uh, sounds funny, but it is what it is. So in this case, ah, wrong key binding. So in this case, so we have a class template or template class that is called my class. We take as input a template parameter a type T. Uh, remember this T is just a letter, could be bananas. And then inside this class, I will have a private data member that is called X, right? And then if you see all the types are T's, so we can instantiate a class that works with integer, double, wherever, without repeating the code. So the compiler will do the job for us. So all about template is living in the static world, something that will happen at compile time and will make your compiler suffer. So whatever you do with templates, it's something that is happening at compile time. And this means that the program that is running there is the compiler that is generating another program for you. And that's why this is also meta programming. Because when you create a class template, it's a, in sort of way, it's a meta class because the compiler is in charge to generate a class for you at compile time. So you can have it whenever you need at runtime. And then the same holds true for, uh, for classes and function, uh, template functions and template classes. 
that you don't pay for what you don't use. So if you don't cover my class with integer type, then the class will not be instantiated, then the compiler will not generate it, then you're free, right? You don't get this. And how you use this? So basically you, you call my class, and then with angular brackets, you specify which type you want to be instantiated at compile time, and then, then you just work as usual with classes. So actually, uh, std vector, for example, is uh, is this syntax. So std vector is a class, and then at compile time, you need to say, I want this vector to be of type t, and then the compiler will generate a vector for you at compile time. So uh, the C++ doesn't ship with any vector class. It ships the standard library ships with a template class for creating vectors. If you want to use integer vectors then the compiler will generate one for you at compile time uh, i am being very repetitive with this but it's something it's actually the most important thing about templates these uh, ideas and then template parameters so what is all this stuff that is going on between the angular brackets so my uh, feeling is that these angular brackets somehow uh, scare people so I know because they are like ugly and this is one of the reasons people uh, doesn't want to use templates at all because the, the ugly syntax right uh, for me it's just syntax so you should you shouldn't worry a lot about this so every template this could be a class or a function is parameterized by one of more template parameters and then the syntax is basically you have the template here the keyword this is from the language itself and then here you have a parameter list and then you have the declaration this could be the class the function whatever and what is important here is that from now on you can think so let's pick the function template as example you can think that you have like two parts so two ways of passing arguments to the function one way of passing these arguments is passing arguments at compile time. I see that the video is lagging. So if you can hear my voice, please let me know in the comments because my feedback completely lag. I think we need to go for the backup one. it's working okay so it's on my end okay sorry guys it's connection mess okay so I, what i was saying okay thank you guys <laughs> so what I was saying is that now, whenever you see a, a template function, you have two ways of passing arguments. One will be the to pass the ar like arguments at compile time, and this is something static. And the other one is passing arguments at runtime, and this is dynamic, right? So let's pick two colors. So red will be whatever you need to pass to the template function at compile time, and this is the template parameter list. And then at runtime, let's pick green, will be this value, right? So you can think whatever you pass into Angular brackets, so it's the same as passing arguments to a function, but in this case, you're passing arguments, template arguments to a template function. It's all confusing, but it's actually for me, it's easy to think like you have two ways of passing stuff to the function, one at compile time, the other one at runtime. Again, it's very unlikely that you can pass something meaningful to an algorithm that needs to work with data at runtime, uh, it's very unlikely that you can pass this data at runtime. So it's something that uh, it's very unlikely that you will use a lot. So in this case, we have this uh, template for a function that is accumulate vector. And then we will take uh, one T. And I guess that this T is basically a type of Ah, it's the type of the data we want to use. And then in this case, we have so we have this other guy that is this or template parameter that is 
a size t so in this case it's not a type name so this is basically this is an integer type this is a real thing so you know who is this it's like could be zero fifty thousand whatever and then we will call this n and actually the same way you can do for default arguments for functions like that this happened at runtime you can say if no one specify you this value at compiled time then just pick 10 and wh wh what is this function template function going to do it's going to create a std vector of the type t and then the value will be repeated n times right and then you just return the sum of all the values so think the template parameters the same way as function arguments but at compiled time and here is an example so again you should try this at your own place it's better if you do it uh, with compiler explorer also so you know what's going on behind the scenes so we have this accumulate vector when whenever we call this so we are saying okay we are not passing any template arguments here so if you see there is nothing here if nothing is between the angular brackets then no template arguments are being passed to the template function and then what is going on here is that the compiler is doing all the job for you first you're using one so this is an integer type so the compiler can go ahead and say okay this t is an integer so i will deduct it up for you no need to tell me and then because you have a default value for this template parameter the compiler say okay i will pick n10 right then you will create a vector with 10 values equal to one and then when you return when you do the reduction you will get a number 10 so you should try it at your computer and see that this is actually 10. so this is one example of calling this template function the compiler will instantiate an integer type with n equals to 10. so the other usage is so again now if you see so let's so here so this is the function and then you have two ways of passing parameters one is at compile time that actually we pick red i think when we do, do the example and then the other one will be at runtime right so this accumulate vector function now you're saying the type is floating point why for example because these two is actually an integer type but you want to cast it to floating point for, for some reason so at compile time you say okay this type name t is a floating point so this will generate a function that will return a floating point here will take a floating point here will create a vector of floating point here and because you didn't specify uh, the n template argument it will use 10 by default and then it will do its magic and at runtime so when you call this function you will pass this number two right so first it will generate this function and then when you call this function at runtime it will pass this argument two and then it will run this algorithm let's say and then the last uh, way of using this is again if you split here just book you have whatever comes to this side is at compile time and this is at runtime so you say give me a floating point for the type name and then use five instead of n equals to 10 i want a vector of five elements and these five must be defined at compile time so you cannot use here a variable you cannot do int integer size equals to this plus this and then put it there because whatever comes to the left to, between the angular brackets must be defined at compile time so this is again extremely sport important this argument the function argument once you have the function generated by the compiler will be whatever you want now we have a 2.0 so we know this at compile time but it could be any variable because this is a function and can work like this like a, any other function at runtime you should say okay give me accumulate this value 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 and then you pick whatever you want to send but remember whatever is between angular brackets must be defined at compile time I will repeat it until you you get sick okay so type deduction in a nutshell so the stuff we saw so far it's the most important stuff so uh, what is really uh, what, what are templates for when this stuff happens uh, for real 
So type deduction. So this is a really nice example. You can try it at your place. So this is basically uh, to replace Compiler Explorer. Uh, you will create a function called foo. And then this puts pretty function, whatever. So this ugly thing, this is a macro, a C macro. That is defined on the C standard library, but it do its job for this example. So type deduction uh, for function templates basically is the, the stuff that the compiler will do for you at compile time. So in this case, we have full, and then if we call this function, it will basically print to the standard output uh, boy foo with, with t equals to int, right? That's basically what's going to happen. And why? Because this for is an integer value. And then at compile time, the compiler will inspect this call and say, okay, this is an integer value. And then let me check your, your class, uh, your function template. You have one t, okay, it's easy. So you're asking this to be an integer. So I will do it for you. Don't worry. No need to use angular brackets. I will deduce the type for you. In this case, we have a, a double, and then you might think it's a floating point, but this literal here is a double, so we generate the double uh, function, and if you call this function, you will print this to the standard output. And the same for this string, that is basically a const car um, pointer, right? So this is basically type deduction. It's when the compiler do the deduction for you. Again, try this example, use different values, different types, uh, to see how this works. So the rules are here, we just keep it exploring. And then here's another example. So let's go through it like if we were the compiler. So first we have a template uh, function. So this is not a function, it's a template to create in functions that takes as uh, template parameters two types, t and u. So let's different colors so this is you and then here we have a new uh, here the t so this is a function it does something it doesn't matter right and then we have another function that actually takes one template parameter that is t and then it takes two input arguments from the same type t that we don't know right good and then let's call f in the in our application with two integers, so this will go here, we'll check, you'll say, okay, this t is an integer, and then the two, it's also an integer, so I will generate, we'll create a function for you at compile time, with t equals to int, and u equals to int, right? Great, and then you call, for some reason, the same template function, but here you say, uh, you use the u literal, uh, so this means like, you sign it int. Uh, it's probably if you try it at your place it's probably easier if you create the variables with the type you want to try because it's more readable but here we don't have space and then the compiler will generate a function at compile time with t equals to int because the one is an integer type and then with the type u that is another type and it's defined at compile time with the duct that this is an unsigned int so it will create this second function for you and then the g function, it takes the same type, so it's two parameters at runtime, but the type uh, type name is, uh, is the same. So whenever you call with integer, this will work. It will generate this uh, g function with t equals to int, so it's only one template parameter. But then if you want to do this, it will fail. And when I say this will fail, I hope you know that this will fail at compile time. So this will not be able to compile. Why? Because you're saying generate a function g. And then the type name, uh, the first one should be, sorry, she is here. The first type name will be t. So I'm contributing to this type deduction with integer. Good. And then the second parameter is unsigned in, but then t should be unsigned in. So if the compiler cannot decide if this is integer or unsigned in, it unsigned in it will just abort. So it's not something you can actually do. It will fail, this is the error message, so you know matching function, whatever. One way of solving this is to specify with angular brackets, integer type, for example. But what's going to happen is that you will, if you do this, you will cast this and sign it in to integer type. But this is basically how type deduction works. So it's not magic, 
the compiler is smart it's smarter than i am as at least but it cannot do magic or stuff that doesn't make sense at all so that's basically the key concepts behind uh, type deduction and then lastly you can also do type deduction since c plus plus 17 so keep this in mind so if you work with another uh, standard this will not work so let's go through the example so we have a class full struct is the same actually this public is not needed and then we will hold a data member of type t and then the constructor will basically take uh, an rt and then we initialize this t and something so the classic syntax will be this one so in this case Ah, yeah so just forget about this so you will create an object so let's delete this so this is not here boom uh, boom it's gone so you will create an object of uh, from the class template foo and then you say okay this t is integral but since c plus plus 17 you can use type deduction and avoid this angular bracket, uh, angular bracket syntax and say okay i will pass an integer to the constructor and actually if you inspect the constructor you have t here so this i mean it makes sense for the compiler it also makes sense when you read it so you can deduct the type at compile time and then create a class foo with type name equals to integer at compile time so you can actually do this and the same holds true for the vector so you have been using vector for a while and then you usually do this so you create a vector and then you use two elements for example but these two elements in this case are integer types so you can actually avoid the this um, angular ragged syntax so this you can avoid it here because you can deduct the type from these two elements of course if you pass here an integer type and an inside int you're using two different types at compile time you cannot guarantee who is t so this will fail of course just don't use this i mean it's easier to read but it's not common and actually if you do this you will only be able to compile this code with c plus plus 17 and then it's going to probably fire back at some point so that's just an example of how type detection works with um with classes and actually so this is something that i will do like to do live like uh, how this works and whatsoever but i will just keep it and then ideally just try to think about this puzzle on your place and then we can discuss it on the discord channel so you can say no for me this doesn't compile whatever of course you can try to compile it and inspect the results but try to before you actually compile it or throw it to compile it expert just try to think this example on your mind and try to compile it uh, locally on your brain and then we can like brainstorm on the discord channel i mean if we were on the classroom i would probably give you five minutes to think about this uh, but here it's going to be a mess using the chat and whatsoever so homework do this and then the last step for knowing all you need to know about templates in c++ for robotics is template specialization right so this is basically mostly the the last big topic for templates so let's say that you have a template for a function that is called is void So again, let's highlight. Uh, so this function, sorry, this template for a function will create a family of function, right? And then ideally, so actually, if you try to read this on a high level understanding, you will say it's a template function that will take any type T and will always return false. No matter how you call this, I will assume that all the types are not void types so i will just return false right but what happened with the actual void types so what happened if we call this is void function with void type in the template argument list so we actually want a true value and then for this we need to do something that is a full specialization that is from this family of function 
you will pick one function, like one particular implementation, and then you will provide the full specialization for this particular function between, among all the functions in the family. And how you do this with this ugly syntax that is basically template and then angular brackets empty. So if you ever saw this on a program and you got confused, now you know that it's basically a full specialization or a template function. And then here on is void, so actually there are many uh, ways of doing uh, many syntax to achieve this result. This is the one I use the most. So you will say the is void is basically this template function, but with type void. So you're saying you have all these family of functions. It can be whatever, but for void, I am in charge of this. I will provide full specialization for this particular function. And then you will return true, right? That's basically what you want. And then no matter, so again, try this example at, at your place, no matter how many functions you create with this boy, you can do this boy with std vector, with arrays, with floating points, double, you name it, it will always return false unless you use boy. Because the only, so whenever you call this template for a function with any type, it will instantiate a new uh, function with the given type and it will always be false, the, the result, except for boy, because it's a full specialization for this particular type. So this is something that is important. For example, if you're working with serialization libraries or with ROS, so if you need to pass a message from one node to another one in ROS, and then the, seri the serialization is not implemented, then you will need to provide a full specialization for the serialization for this particular type. And if you are interested in this, I can show you some examples like offline, but that's basically when you will want to use this. And then the syntax is the prefix with definition template, angular brackets empty, and then you got to write the function definition. And this is like, this is like a function. And this. What you're seeing here is a full specialization for a class function, for a template function, but it's a function indeed. So whenever you do this, you will create, you will generate this symbol at compile time. So this is something that will happen. So this is equivalent to write the function. And then usually means you don't need to write any more angular brackets at all. Uh, whenever you do this full specialization, unless the type can be deducted, like the previous case or this particular case. So we have, for example, size of t, and then this size of is a C function that it's not defined for void. So if you want to define size of for all the types in a C++ program, then we need to do a full specialization for void. And why we use Angular brackets here? Because size of does not take any input argument. So whenever we call this function, so if you call uh, size of whatever, you are not passing any argument to the function. So the compiler at compile time, cannot uh, deduce this type. So no input arguments, impossible to deduce the type at compile time. So you actually need to specify this. Or the thing that could happen is that unless t is default. So what you're going to do, for example, in this case, you say, okay, this type name t, again, this is a template argument list. All the rules for arguments holds true. The same is like you can use default arguments. And you say this t will be void unless you specify something different. So when you instantiate this full specialization for my size of, now you, you don't need to do angular brackets anymore because the type is void unless you specify something different, right? So that's basically full specialization of function templates. And then actually there's something also that is not super useful that is called partial specialization. That is basically is any sort of is the same type of specialization, but in cell itself is a template. So this means that it still requires further customization by the user before it can be used. So for example, you can create this uh, variable. So this is a template variable that is called is array, and then you say it's always false, right? For any type t, it's false. And then now you you will think, okay, but if I want this to be true for like arrays, then I need to do the same as we did like before with function overloading. I need to define, uh, do full specialization for array of integer, array of double and blah, blah, blah. Or I can say, okay, I will do a partial specialization for any type T, P, 
that is an array type. So this is a syntax for, so this is a template for an array. So this could be any sort of array. And then the is array template variable will be true for this type of data. But this is not a full specialization because it's still a template and it still need to be instantiated at compile time and need further customization. When this happens, when you call this with integer array, for example, then it will go here and say, okay, I will generate this variable for this integer array type, and this will be equal to true. If you do this with floating point array, then you will generate another template variable, and then it will be always equal to true, right? So it's probably confusing, but it's basically it. And then last, lastly, so this is like a build uh, thing. This is something that people already struggle with Homeboard 3 or 4, I don't remember. So concrete templates are instantiated at compile time. Now you know it. Whatever happens with template will happen when at compile time. And then the linker has no idea about the implementation. And then there are three options basically to work with templates and to split the header and the source. And probably, I think we have time, I will do the example. So let's actually do the example. For this, we need an editor. Uh, and then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so let's for now let's say that let's start simple, right? So let's create a template for a function, then template. And then type name, it's going to be t. And then let's call this function void foo. To be foo or something more meaningful. Let's do foo for now. That's fine. And then this foo will take an input argument, a const reference to a t. And then return uh, x. Basically, nothing. Right, so let's actually, no, let's keep this so we can print to that. Let's instantiate at compile time with integer type, for example, and then five, right? This will basically return five. And because five is an integer, the compiler can detect the type. So let's first make and then make, boom, it's working, so five. And then the compiler can do this for us, so no need to do it. And then A and B. It's still five. So if I do 5.5, then it will be another function at compile time, and it is working, right? So far, so good. So let's, let's say that, so this is a small example. Let's pretend we need to use a real build system, then we need to use header resources, whatever. So let's create a new file called um, uh, foo.h <laughs> app. And then let's pragma once. And actually, something that. And then let's. It is probably too big. I do this yes sir so this is full.hpp and then let's move this over here and then now we include uh, full hpp right again if we want to build this it's working Me sorry main Bam. it's working what is happening here is that you have the template for this function here on the header. And then at compile time, you include this, and then you know that including a file is basically copy pasting the content here, and then you put it here. And then when you call this, the compiler will be able to generate. But what usually happens is that you will, you will feel the temptation of doing the same that you do for uh, normal functions, that is to do the following. So let's create... Uh, uh, foo.cpp and then can I do this even come on stupid VS code 
he okay this will do the job i guess so what you're going to do is you will say okay um include foo this is super confusing actually and it's really a really common mistake so you say okay oops change so you have the header file and you say okay i have this declaration and then the definition is here and then forget about the the errors for now and then why you want to do this because you like this idea of like splitting function and whatsoever but what is happening here is that let's add this actually to the build so let's add foo.cpp to the build and then if you already struggle with templates you will know that this will not work so let's remove this it's not needed let's move this here and then that's a lot of information so the main application then the hero file with the template class declaration and here is the implementation so you will expect this to work but what happened what will happen is that at, it will fail at link time and then you will see the error now and then if you ever saw this error i will explain you why is this so ld is basically the, the linker and, and it says undefined symbol for this foo with integer type right and why is this because the compiler when you include this it will see the declaration so it will not fail to compile but then remember that this will be a promise and then at link time you need to provide a symbol and you say what but i am actually compiling foo.cpp right what is happening here what is happening that this is not a function implementation so again this is a template for a function so whenever the compiler comes to compile this thing no one is actually calling foo so it doesn't see this so the foo.cpp doesn't see this call so the compiler will just ignore this template function and skip it right and that's why this symbol is not being defined so you have multiple options here so one is to so the first one is to do it everything on the header file and then for this it's uh, so if you're writing like libraries like boost libraries are all like this you just put everything there and remember that in this case and this is really important as well you're actually not uh, putting the implementation on the header file you just have a template for a function there and then when you include this file and you call a function the compiler will generate the function for you so this is different it's not like putting an implementation like a normal function implementation on the header file so that's number one and then what could happen is that you say Nacho, I have a lot of function and I actually like this idea of just showing the API of the function without the implementation because it's readable, it's more readable for me. You, you can do this and for that you have two options. The first one that is common but I don't like is that you put this here and then at the end, at the very end of the header file, you, you can include another header file that is going to be called a foo and then impl whatever some people do ipp but this is ugly and then hpp and inside this header file you put implementation so basically what you want to do is to for impl hpp and then now if you see this file so this you don't need and then here you put the implementation for the class template, uh, the function template. This is really common. And actually when you see this, the foo is going actually to be foo.h. So this is really common. If you see um, on libraries, boost library, they do this on PCL library whatsoever. And then what is happening here, this is like a mess that when you include this header file, you will see this. And then at the end of the header file, you will include this another header file. And then you know that whenever you include an, uh, any file, you basically copy paste this into the header file. So it's basically the same as before. So if we try to build this, it should work. And it's not working, of course. Why it's not working? Uh, pragma once, this is a header, so you need to be careful with this. And uh, why? 
uh, why not found okay why why not found full input why it doesn't found the file it's weird okay i will make this work uh, why is this not working? So full. So this should be working, and we will make it work. Uh, tick, tick, tick. Ah, it's the same. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Probably I will make this less big because it's hard to me to see. And then, ah, come on, this should work. Okay, redefinition of foo. Why is this? Ooh. Ah, because I am I I forgot to remove this from the build. So let's forget for this full CPP right now. And then yeah, now this should work. Come on. Trust me. I'm an engineer. And then make now it's working. If we call the function, we will see the same. And then what you have right now is basically this um, split between the header file and the source file. And actually, this is readable as well. So you can actually hear like put uh, comments, like blah, blah, blah. And then you hide implementation on another file. This actually works and it's the same as putting the implementation here. Uh, it's a bit funky to see an include. Uh, statement at the end of another file but it's basically to, to make the core more readable there's nothing but with this that's one option if you want to split and then the other option is let's go back to this and now go back to main let's remove this input thing and then you go away and it's the following so here on the on the foo.cpp Whenever you build the model, you need to say right now, okay, please compiler instantiate the function, the full function from the family for this given type. So let's say that you know that for now you only need to work with integer and doubles. So what you're going to do is you're going to do template, template, and then you will do uh, double and then full. And to make it clear, let's do double here and then const double uh, x, and then that's basically it. So, with this, you're basically saying it's like calling the function with double type, right? You're basically saying, please generate this function for me. It's the same as doing this, but you're not specifying any argument. This is telling the compiler, please do it for integer and then for double, sorry let's make this and then here will be int and here will be int as well so now so let's try to build this now we are building this foo.cpp model like if we are doing like a library thing and then now ah it's not working of course uh, undefined foo int why is this maybe this is not needed okay so the syntax is different you don't need to do this full specialization thing you just say this is a template for for this uh, function template here of course you need the implementation and now now when you make it and build it it's working and again this is actually confusing but it's simple my recommendation is try to do the three uh, ways of working with templates so everything on the header file, uh, two header files or one header file and one CPP with particular uh, implementations. So in this case, now you, you achieve this goal of uh, splitting stuff. And I want to show you that this is not actually uh, uncommon on real examples. So if you go to Open3D, for example, this was on Geometry, KD3, Flan. So there is a KD3 implementation needs to work with templates and for example you have this search 
template for a function and then you don't so here you don't have the, like the, the implementation for this function why because you want to keep this easy so the header file you want to only have uh, declarations and not definitions but when you work with templates you need to provide at compile time um, the implementation so if you go to the kd3 so the dot cpp and if you see ppp so now here you have this search function so actually let's do search knn and then if you remember this was a template for a function and now you have the implementation for a t but remember that you need to tell the compiler which one will be the types that you will be using because the compiler needs to generate a symbol this is the third example we saw today and then it's the same so template blah 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 and then here you do for eigen vector of 3d and for an eigen vector of xd and that's basically it so you are only generating two functions at compile time for this template function so from above all the among all the family functions you are picking two and then you are not doing any full specialization so you're just not you're not doing this you're just telling the compilers just go and search for the function template but use type t equals to blah 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 and then you will get this why you want to do this because you want to split the the implementation from the declaration between header and source file and actually if you say this is stupid and it's not because the implementation is the same and it's much easier to just copy paste that this three line syntax than copy pasting the full implementation for two types and then if you change one in other one you will forget to change it on the other one and that's whatsoever so that's basically it here are the the three ways of doing it again my recommendation try it at your place and then lastly super easy const expert basically means try to do this at compile time so we have been discussing how to do stuff at compile time in this case if you try this on compile expert you will see that this whenever you return this factorial to 10 this is guaranteed to be computed at compile time so this function is a function not for the program but for the compiler so you're saying you're telling the compiler please uh, compute this function at compile time and then again you need to think about like what is happening at compile time and runtime so this uh, const expert can be also applied for variables and then if you say okay give me at compile times the size of this vector uh, on this case will not work because the size of the vector is dynamic and this means that it might change but this doesn't hold true for an array because an array you're passing and now you know what is the meaning of this you're passing okay i want an array of 10 elements and then the size it's guaranteed to be 10 at compile time so this can be a const expression but this cannot be a const expression why because this is you don't know the, the size so that's a small detail so one question is can you use templates for other types as well or must all types be defined in the cpp file so that's a really good question so if you go for option number three you need to define all the types you want to use in that file so if we go to the um, open 3 example you're only allowed to actually sometimes it doesn't make sense to use it with other types but you're only allowed to do it with eigenvector 3d or with eigenvector xt if you call this function with any other type this means it will not work and this is a really good question and this will happen uh, so that's basically the I see lags on my feedback okay so again these slides were heavily inspired by this cpp con talk it's actually two parts it's one hour each if you have time just go through it you will find similarities between the examples there and the one from this slide uh, it's highly 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 recommended to watch this cpp con so please if you have time just do it and then here are the references basically it's all about we saw all about templates in c++ i am sure that if you understand this one hour lecture then that's all you need to know to work with templates then there's much more information detail like 
variadic templates and const expert everywhere it's a mess but you need to know the basics you need to have the ability to reason at compile time versus runtime and whatsoever that's one of the most important things and then we saw on a live example how to work with with uh, with the three cases of working with header only files to header or header plus cpp file for templates because this is something that is really really common to be confused and it's something that i'm i'm guessing that you're really struggling with and then that's it we are going to i now i'm going to go through a really five minutes course wrap up and then that was basically the end of the lectures so we started this journey 10 weeks ago saying that talk is cheap show me the code so i hope i show you as much c++ code as i could uh, I also promise you that you will get your hands dirty. So there are nine homeworks. I guess that most of you at least uh, did this. So you know what I, what is the, the philosophy and probably after. So people still struggling with build system after seven homeworks. And that's the idea that you should get your hands dirty to get through all these issues. Uh, we saw how to work with the new Linux systems. We saw how to work with simple bash programs. How to redirect the standard output, the standard error, and what is the standard input, how a program works in a Unix-like environment. We also saw a lot of stuff from the software development ecosystem. So we saw text editor, linters, test, uh, static code analysis like client TDI format, this is client format, the CI CD, Git, uh, build system. So we saw most of the stuff for uh, doing real development. So we we have one lecture on build system that for me is extremely important because sometimes you lose the ideas that you want to express in your course in your code because of the build so the same with templates holds true for the third example it's hard to make it build but the ideas are good so sometimes if you don't know how to build you lose the idea we saw how to use CMake to simplify all of our builds also the ligas how to declare a variable uh, how to create functions for C++. I try, I hope I convince you like which one are good C++ practices. This is not, there is no book for this. So there's the CPP core guidelines, but they are like really hard to follow sometimes. And I hope that I try to convince you that why it's important to use uh, C++ and not C and whatsoever. We saw how to use containers on C++. They are much better than just using plain arrays. Also, we discussed the difference between the static and the dynamic world. We saw which, who, who is using containers in our uh, community. My video is completely lagging. I hope you're seeing this. And also we saw iterators, how to decouple the algorithm implementation from the data. Uh, this is basically using uh, iterators. So this is also a type of generics programming. Uh, we saw like 15 or 20 SCL algorithms, also the C++ utilities like move semantics uh, and other stuff. We quickly discussed the file system library. We introduced how to create new types for C++ and we say why this is super important. We managed to represent an abstraction of the real world with a C++ program. We discussed all the anatomy of a C++ class. We briefly discussed about move semantics. We also saw some object-oriented design patterns, like how to do inheritance in C++, how to do polymorphism, where objects will behave differently. And we also did this at runtime, but also we, do it, we did it at compile time with the CRTP pattern. We saw other patterns for object-oriented design. And then lastly, we work with memory RAM. I hope I convinced you that there is a huge difference between the heap and the stack and when you should use which one. And then we saw all the memory issues that will come into place if you use, if you manage yourself your memory and then you say, okay, smart pointers will do it for you. It's much better, just use it. And then lastly, this is basically all the summary of all the stuff we saw. And then where to go from now? So we end up with the lectures. So we enter phase number four, the fourth part of this course, that is the final project. For this, I will not say much words because all the details will be communicated to you um, through the in an email and basically you have 
from now on you have like more or less one month and a half to do this project and my recommendation is um, so keep on schedule with the with homework so you can start working on the project as soon as possible and then that's basically it thank you very very much for all your patience across all these 10 weeks i hope i really um, gave you some c++ understanding and from now on it's all up to you so i hope you have the basics from my side i did a, as much effort as i could and i hope you enjoy the the course as well so thank you very much for staying with me as usual questions complaints whatever you can ping me on discord so thank you very much guys for saying <laughs> okay and see you on friday